Hi, I'm Pete, and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. It's been a long time coming, but I finally got everything together that I need to rebuild the hydraulic pump for the MD. And this is a pretty common pump. It's called a liftall pump. International Harvester used them in the H's, the M's, the MD, of course. Lots and lots of tractors. They're a pretty amazing design for the time. They were designed in the 1930s. And they're very unique in that they combine the hydraulic pump with a hydraulic control valve. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time in this video talking about exactly how this pump works as well as rebuilding it and in general, how these old hydraulic pumps work. This hydraulic pump is what's called a belly pump because it sits in the belly of the tractor. It sits in this opening right here and the engine drives this shaft, the clutch shaft, back into the transmission. The hydraulic pump's actually driven off the transmission counter shaft, which rotates in an opposite direction. This shaft rotates this way, the counter shaft rotates counterclockwise. The pump is driven off of that. It's not a live pump, so when you push in the clutch, the pump stops because all the gears in the transmission stop when you push in the clutch, so the pump isn't powered anymore. Before I do anything else, I need to put a new seal in where the drive shaft comes into the front plate of the pump here. Because the old one was leaking very badly. There we go. And the next step is to put the needle bearings back in this bearing in here. And I carefully saved all the needles. And we need some sticky stuff to hold the needles in during assembly. So I put a little grease in the race of the bearing in here. This pump is pretty unique from other lift dolls in that originally these were bronze bushings in here and this one has all needle bearings. Not sure what the deal is with that. I didn't read of any manufacturing change, but that may be so. And we'll just put these little guys back in here, get them all lined up. They gotta slide in at an angle past the flange of the bearing and then straighten out. I took them all out just to make sure that I didn't lose any of them when I was moving parts around. And that's what the needles look like, all stacked in there, greased in place. One of the first things I did when I pulled this pump apart is I evaluated it for wear. These pump gears, the uh, drive gear and the driven gear, ride on this plate and they turn. And over time, when dirt gets into the oil, you wind up with scoring like this. Now, as I evaluated it, this plate is acceptable because I, if I didn't have gloves on, I can't catch a fingernail. It hasn't worn it's just a surface kind of scoring. The other plate, however, was in worse shape and that had quite a wear groove in it. And I'm gonna show you some footage of how I took that wear out of it. In order to keep things perfectly flat, because the plate has to stay perfectly flat, you put a piece of float glass down, which by its nature is perfectly flat. And then I used varying grits of sandpaper to smooth out the plate. And it is a tedious job. I could have taken it to a machine shop and have them put it on a bed, a bed sander on a milling machine, but as you know, <laughs> machine shops can take weeks to get simple things done, so I decided to do it here. I didn't need to take it down to a glass smooth surface, I just needed to take that wear off the plate so it was flush. One of the considerations when you're hand sanding like this is that the more you sand, the more likely you are to come off of having a flat plane. It's just the nature of hand sanding even though it's on float glass that you wind up with some regularity. So I took it down as much as I needed. And as you can see from the finished product here, you can still see some rings, but this is all flush. So we're good to go. The next step is to check our clearances because with a hydraulic pump, it's all about how tightly things run and how much oil leaks past the driving surfaces. So. First, I'm gonna put the drive shaft in. We'll lube it up a little bit to get it through the seal. And that goes right in like this. This is the shaft that's driven off the front of the pump here. And next, we can put in the driven gear, which, like the drive gear, has needle bearings in it as well. Now I can slide the driven gear on the shaft, being careful of the needle bearings. And everything is oiled. The reason I spent all the time messing around with this plate is the clearance between the face of the gears and the face of the plate is very important because that's where you're going to get oil leaking past and not building pressure. The way that this pump builds pressure is that when I put the housing around the gears here, the oil comes in through the inlet here 
and is actually spun around, caught and spun around the outside face of these gears and compressed. And that compressed oil is then brought into this passage. So it's not the motion through the middle of the gears because you wouldn't get a lot of compression of the oil that way. It packs it around the outside. So the clearances that are really important are the clearance of the end of the gear teeth to the case here and the clearance you have on the top and the bottom of the case, just like an oil pump, to keep oil from escaping past the end of the gears. So the way I have this sitting together right now, you can see, see the daylight under the ruler? The gears are standing proud of the case. And that is why the pump has shims in it. They shim up the pump body to the right distance. And these are the two that we're in to begin with. We're going to check the clearance with them in. There's no gaskets or sealants on this pump body. It's all machined flat surfaces that hold pressure via their flatness instead of a gasket. And we'll put the body back on. Let's oil this up here. I want to oil this up. Lots of oil is a good thing. As I said, there's two dimensions to check. The first is the clearance of the pump gear to the body. And this body moves. It's not sitting in a groove or anything. And I'll get to how to take care of that movement later on. But the, the spec clearance is a thousandths to five thousandths between the gear uh, and the body. One thousandths, no problem. Let's see, five thousandths is the maximum. Mm, barely, but remember I've pushed the body all the way over and so we're splitting that clearance between the two sides once we get everything centered up. So we're good to go. The second clearance to check is between the pump plates and the pump gears. And remember I put the shims back in that were originally in here and I check these just like I would an oil pump. I take a straight edge and I lay it on the gears and then I check with feeler gauges to see what my clearance is between the gear and the body. So the spec clearance is between three thousandths and seven thousandths. My three thousandths feeler gauge passes under both gears and my seven thousandths feeler gauge does not. I want to build this up in kind of the order that the pump flows in so that you can understand how it works as I build it up. So we've taken care of the basic oil compression part and oil pumping part. The next part is the start of the valve system that controls the oil flow out to the hydraulic cylinders. And to start that, I'm going to have to take this back. Let's get this stuff out of here. I won't need that till much later. You neither. You can go out. Whoops. You didn't want to go back into the pump, must be. You want to take a vacation. We need you guys. Ah. Don't do that. Someday I'll be able to afford a level table. All right. <laughs> Now in this front plate of the pump body, you see these two holes. This is where the compressed oil goes out, the oil under pressure. And one hole, let me see if I can remember this correctly. One hole goes to this rear outlet and the other hole goes to um, these two ports here, which go into the front part of the case and go to two front parts. To assemble these, there's a little retainer that goes in here and a spring. Next point of major repair that I had to do, there's two balls, these are check valve balls that sit on these springs. And when I put the pump body on, the springs and the balls go in these holes here. And at the bottom of each one, there is a seat that the ball needs to sit against tightly. And I'll get to why in a minute. These balls were badly worn, especially this one. You can see where it wore into the seat. So what I had to do is both replace the balls and hone the seats or grind the seats or lap the seats, however you want to say. And fortunately, these balls here are just three quarter inch steel balls. So I bought from McMaster Car a bag of steel balls three quarter inch, same alloy as ball bearings, hard stuff. I made a grinding tool by just welding a piece of rod onto one of these three quarter inch balls, putting valve lapping compound on it and running it onto the seat of the ball to get that seat cleaned up. And here's what the seats look like now. That lighter gray color is the smooth metal where the balls seat in. And I wound up cl cleaning up both of them. These two valves that I'm working on are called the check valves because when you stop the pump, when you've extended a cylinder, 
the check valve engages to keep the oil in the cylinder instead of just gushing back down into the pump. And I'll show you once again how that works. The last thing I want to check with these check valves is the spring free length, which is supposed to be an inch and an eighth plus or minus a 32nd. And I'm just a touch under an inch and an eighth with that one. And I'm a touch over an inch and an eighth with that one. So the springs are fine. Move them up. I just like to play in oil, you know. Ever since I was a kid, I'd come in from the garage covered in oil, black, grease, oil, you name it. Now I can set the body back on over the check valves. Down she goes. And so following what happens, compressed oil comes up through here and then forces its way past these check valves if there's pressure in the housing here. That's kind of the next step. And that reminds me about a manufacturing change in this pump and a retrofit change. The earlier of these pumps, these are very low pressure pumps, were only 450 psi pounds per square inch, whereas a modern pump, I don't know what a modern pump, but the pumps in the 656 operated around 1800 psi. They upgraded them on later models and they made rebuild kits that brought them up to a whole 750 PSI. What I have here is an earlier pump. The later pumps were marked on um, the reservoir case. First thing we want to put together on this is the pressure relief valve, which tells the pump to stop and kick off when it reaches a certain pressure. And we just have to make sure we line up this hole with the yoke that's going to go in it. Let's see, does it go that way? Holes? Nope. It goes the other way. There, we've got the hole going the free travel of that slot, which we're going to put something in later. The next part of this is actually putting together the pressure relief valve assembly. And again, that's got a steel ball that acts on a seat to either open or close the valve. And then you've got this that sits on the steel ball and then a spring, which gets compressed by this. So when the pressure inside here becomes enough to push that ball valve open by working against the spring then it dumps pressure out of the pump even when you're still pulling on the control rod and asking the cylinders to raise. Once they hit the end of their travel this pops up, the ball pops up, oil dumps out of here and you've reached the end of travel. One interesting thing I found, I'm going to take back my earlier statement, the free length of this spring according to the INT book is about 1 and 5 sixteenths. This one's actually 1 and 7 eighths and this is the part you would upgrade to go to the higher pressure pump. So I believe this pump's been upgraded to the 750 PSI because it takes more resistance to compress this longer spring and dump pressure. You gotta press on this to get it started on the threads. So this is the hole that the relieved oil would escape out of. This cap goes over it. So now we can go to the next step in pump operation. Pressurized oil comes out through here, forces its way past these balls, and then out to the cylinders that you're controlling with hydraulics. That is, if this chamber is pressurized. And this chamber is not pressurized unless you're pulling on the lever. So this hole in here is controlled by a yoke that I'm going to put on in a second. And when it is in the upper position here, you can see there's a big hole on the side of the housing. So the oil that's being pumped by the pump is just dumping out of this hole. But when you engage the yoke and push this sleeve down, it blocks off that hole so that this cavity can be pressurized and push oil past these balls and into the cylinders. Pretty simple. Oil will continue to build up in this cavity or act under pressure in this cavity but it has a means to escape even while it's under pressure. There's two little holes in here and that allows the relief valve up here to sense what the oil pressure is and as it works against that ball and pushes that ball out when it hits the right pressure, then it dumps the oil out and you've reached the end of the stroke. Huey, lots of dad splaining in this video, but I think it's important to know how these things work so I hope I haven't slowed things down too much with all the talk. We can go ahead and put the body together now. And the last thing to remember to put in 
is these little pistons here that work against these check valves. And they're part of the operation assembly, which I'll get to when we put the yokes on. Just oil them up, put them in the bores. See, they line up one on top of each ball and they'll act against that ball when the operation of the pump goes into, hey, drop the cylinders, release the pressure, let the cylinders back down, the hydraulic cylinders that is. So this just fits together on here. And you gotta make sure you get the shafts lined up. There we go. And then we got a bunch of bolts to hold it all together. Remember, no gaskets, no gasket and seal, and it, remain, it relies on the machine surfaces to make a tight enough seal. Forgot about that. This one's got a little tab here that holds the shaft and keeps it from creeping out should it come loose from the front. I have to take that back apart to get that bolt in. Not a big deal. I'm just going to turn down these bolts till they're not snug, but just above the face of the plate here. Because there's another step before you tighten them down. And before I set the pump body, I want to put this nut on here that drives the pump from the counter shaft on the transmission because I'm going to need to be able to turn things. This gives me a way to do it. Now this pump body has the ability to float because the bolt holes are larger than the bolts. So I need to center as best I can the pump body on the gears inside here without being able to see them. And the way to do that is you turn the pump and I'm turning it from the underside here and listen for any interference and feel for any interference and then just wiggle this plate around or this body around till you get it to where it runs smoothly. If you push it all the way to one side and push it that way I can feel it drag and then when I start to pull it back it smooths out. And I think that's good right there. No torque spec provided but I want them all the same torque so looking at the torque tables half inch bolts I figured around 40 foot pounds. Why? Why not? They do need to be tightened evenly. Exact torque probably isn't all that big a deal. Actually let's take them more up toward a grade 5 bolt because I think they're closer to that hardness so that would be around 55 pounds. Foot pounds, pound feet, Depending on whether you're an engineer or a mechanic, when I was in school we always said pound feet, but that was structural engineering. A little bit different than mechanics. There. Good deal. She feels nice now. Hear that? That's the sound of a tight pump that's going to prime itself easily. That's one of the reasons you're liberal with the oil so it primes easily on first startup. The oil level on this pump runs right about here in the reservoir, so not quite enough to immerse the gears in oil. Now we have to put the control linkages onto this, starting with this big yoke here. It's got to go in there like that. Get everything lined up. This one's got a big spring on it that you got to work on. There we go. And this other rod goes through that actuation valve that. I was messing with. We gotta line up the hole before we put it in. We use whatever's at hand. There we go. That's a dipstick. It goes on with a couple washers like that. So this whole yoke assembly here works this valve up and down. Remember this is the valve that either pressurizes the chamber out to the cylinders or lets the pressure dump off back into the case. With the lever at rest, it's dumping oil out there. See the hole? When I actuate the valve, it closes the hole and it pressurizes the pump. Next, we have another yoke that goes right on here, but there's a little spring here that acts on the yoke that you got put in first. And then this yoke goes on with a pin. There we go. Now that I've got this buttoned up, I can, all I got is extra long cotter pins. Put new cotter pins in it and get those all set. I guess better too long than too short. Archaic technology you say? Yeah, I say bulletproof technology. 70 years is still going strong. Now how does this hydraulic valve work? Because these are quite a bit different from modern hydraulic valves where you pull and push on a lever and it stops when you stop pushing and 
completely different feel. Let me set this up like I'm sitting on the tractor. If I'm sitting on the tractor, the pump faces this way. So I'm on the seat, the front of the tractor is toward you, and I've got the hydraulic control rod next to the seat. And when I pull that rod back, there's a rock shaft here in the reservoir housing where, that goes through and engages with this ear right here. So when I'm pulling the lever back because of the action of that rock shaft, this pushes forward. And when this pushes forward, it changes the position of this dump valve here. So as I pull the lever forward, it closes that gap and the pump stops dumping oil and starts to pressurize. So once it starts to pressurize, it's sending oil through the check valves and out to the hydraulic cylinder. So I can raise as much as I want. And once I have those cylinders to the position I want, I've raised them enough. It doesn't have to be all the way. It could stop midstream. There's a little pin on this rod and you set the pin on your side of the little pin stop on the rod and so that stops all the action now. The pump is still holding some pressure but it's at an equilibrium with the cylinder so it may be dumping some oil but the check valves are holding what you've put into the cylinders into the cylinders. Now when I take this rod and I push it forward, if you've run one of these, you remember when you push it forward there's a little detent and you you go past that detent to drop the cylinders. Well what happens is, number one, this has a locking function. So this little arm here locks when you go into the raise position. So if you want to fully raise the cylinders, you can do that. And then once they hit their maximum travel pressure builds in them and this relief valve pops, pushes on this tab here and allows this to come down. See how it popped out? So you've raised and left them in that raised position. Now when you go to release the cylinders you can push past that held position and now I'm lowering the cylinders. That's that little that's that little detent that you feel. When this valve pops and lowers, it comes down on those two little pistons, the little pistons right here, and those pistons control the check valve. So when I pop the valve down, it engages those check valves and lets the fluid from the pistons or the hydraulic cylinders come back through the pump and the cylinders drain down. It's important to note that this is a one-way pump, so it has pressure going out to push the cylinders out. But when you want to lower the implement or retract the cylinders, this pump doesn't power that retraction. Gravity powers the retraction. The weight of what the cylinders are holding up powers the retraction. So that's what forces fluid back into the pump. These pumps can be converted to two-way, in other words, power raise and power lower, by adding a, a hydraulic valve downstream of the pump, like this tractor had on it, the way my dad modified it. Or there's also a two-way valve that International made that goes on the tree, which is on the fill port of the reservoir that you can add as well. Now that I got the pump together, we can put it back into the reservoir here, and this is the whole oil supply for the pump oil isn't pressurized in here. This is what the pump draws from and dumps back into. This is where the control rod comes through and that's that rock shaft I was talking about that rocks back and forth. So the first step is to put that in. And that's just got a simple little rubber seal that goes on it. And then this is a keyed shaft and the key is a washer that goes into this. So this just slides in here. And on the inside we just line everything up in here which you probably can't see. <laughs> I can see sort of. Whoops. All right, it's time for Nimble Fingered Ned. I don't know if I got it in me today. No, don't go back there. You're a bugger. Okay. Lock washer, bolt. There. Next we can put the gasket on. And then put the pump in. We have to make sure that this slot here lines up with the control rock shaft that goes through. 
And that's a feel thing, which kind of stinks. All the while not messing up the gasket. That's not right. That feels right. Now before I bolt this in, I want to attach the control rod and make sure I've got the linkage hooked up right. In other words, that it's engaged with the ear. Yep, I know that's right. Okay, then we can bolt everything together. All right, it's all back together. This is where this control rod goes, but I can't put the control rod on until it's back in the housing because it has to go through the housing to engage this. Same with the outlets. There's three outlets. There's one on this side, and then there's two on this side. This is the fill port up on top, which also the tree would be connected to if you have a tree with the fill port and along with a second valve up here. And then there's a drain plug down in the bottom. A couple other things about these. There's no filter, so <laughs> keeping the fluid clean is really important. There's no way to filter it out. It's all a sealed unit in here. You can change the fluid, but there's no filter. The other thing is that International made a, a method of retarding the drop when you had cultivator gangs hooked up to this so that you could drop the front one or the rear ones at a different rate than the opposite one. And the way they did that is there was a flow restriction valve, which is just a, a tube with a pin in it and then a plate that restricts the flow so that the cylinder would uh, lose its fluid a little bit slower than the other ones. It was as simple as that. You would connect that onto whatever port you wanted to control that slower gang with. Oh, and another thing, unlike modern hydraulic systems, these were designed to run on plain oil, and I've heard of people even going to heavier weight oil if they have problems building pressure in these pumps. Not the real thin stuff like is used in modern pumps. And that's it. Here's the finished pump and reservoir with all the fittings on it ready to be painted. I hope this video was informative for those of you who may have to work on a hydraulic lift all pump from an H or an M or even an MD. What's next for this tractor? Well, it's time to start cleaning and painting. I think that this is the last sort of mechanical component that I had to rebuild and now I've just got to knuckle down and start cleaning off wheel centers, seat, you know, light bar, all the stuff that goes on here. And then when I get a batch of parts hung up and sort of a full batch ready, I'll go ahead and paint them along with this um, transmission and torque tube here. And then we'll just start adding pieces back on. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll bring you back when it's time to paint again. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.